behalf of the president of the Albert Einstein Society, Professor Ott, who unfortunately cannot be with us today, I would like to welcome all of you uh, to the Einstein Lectures 2023. Especially, I would like to welcome our young audience. So at various levels from students, but even uh, maybe school kids, fans of math Olympiads and whatsoever. Uh, we welcome those who are attending today, but also those who will watch the podcasts later because they cannot come today. This is the 14th edition of the Einstein Lectures, which are organized uh, jointly by the Albert Einstein Society and the University of Bern, and which are in turn dedicated to physics, mathematics, and philosophy. My name is Christiane Tretter. I'm professor of mathematics here at the University of Bern. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce the fifth Einstein lecturer in mathematics, Professor Marina Wiasowska from the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. With just 39 years since two days, if I found out correctly, Marina is the youngest Einstein lecturer we've ever had. And also in other respects, her life and career stand out. She was born in Kiev, and there her high talent in mathematics was uh, discovered and super supported early in school. She competed in several domestic and international math Olympiads, wrote her first research paper when she was just 21. Then she obtained a master's degree in Germany uh, from Kaiserslautern in 2007, and then did a PhD back in Kiev at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine um, in 2010, and she got another one from the University of Bonn in 2013. Only three years later, well prepared, of course, uh, from the PhD. Uh, in March 2016, she had completed, after some longer research work before, I assume, uh, the two research papers that got her to the Olympus of math six years later. Within a week in March, she posted her solutions of the sphere packing problem in dimensions 8 and 24 on Archive, which is the free mathematical preprint server available to everyone. And with these solutions, she stunned the entire mathematical community um, because they were so ingenious and elegant, and of course, because also so many other much more experienced researchers had tried to solve these problems before her. Then a whole avalanche of prizes followed, among them the Salem Prize in 2016, the Clay Research Award in 2017, a New Horizon in Math Prize in 2018, the Fermat Prize in 2019, a prize of the European Math Society EMS in 2020, and then in 2022 the Fields Medal, the highest award in math for scientists under the age of 40. This fields, the Fields Medals, there are four each four years, they are awarded by the International Mathematical Union, usually at the International Congress of Mathematicians. As a treasurer of the Swiss Math Society, I had the great pleasure to be a member of the Swiss delegation to the IMU, and Marina was another delegate, by chance. Um, but of course, nobody knew what would then happen. And so, uh, because I was there, this took place in Helsinki, but not within an ICM, because the ICM was scheduled for July 2022 for St. Petersburg. But then Finland was so generous to jump in and hold the ceremony and at least the IMU assembly. So this was how I came to be part of this award ceremony. And it, it is a memorable moment uh, in, in my career to, to, to be there when Marina was awarded the prize. And of course, I took the chance 
um, after the award ceremony to invite her. I'm not sure if at the time she was aware it's three lectures and not just one. Um, um, but anyway, we are very, very happy that you are here, that you accepted the invitation, and we are very much looking forward to your talk on the sphere packing problem. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for, the, for inviting me here. Also, thank you for the introduction. And so today I will speak about the sphere packing problem. And so let me start with explaining in very general words what this means. Uh, so <clears throat> imagine that you have a very, very big box, maybe, <clears throat> and an infinite supply of balls. And then the question would be how many balls can you fit into the box? And then if uh, the box is much, much bigger than the size of, uh, of each of these uh, equal balls, uh, then this becomes a question really of the, not of the exact number, but rather the density. Uh, so um, well, then we would know that the number of balls inside of the box, it will be roughly speaking the volume of this box divided or multiplied by some number, this, the density constant. And so what we are interested in, in, de in determining, because there are many different si shapes and sizes of boxes that we can consider, but we would like really to focus only on this one number, the density. And so, again, to, to, to clarify what, what, what the rules of our games are, that all balls, they're hard balls, they all have the same size, uh, and they're allowed to touch each other and not allowed to intersect. And so, uh, so here in this picture you see this like intuitive three-dimensional picture that we have and now an interesting component that I would like to introduce is that also the notion of dimension. So what we can do, we can consider this question not only in our favorite familiar three-dimensional space but in different dimensions. And so before we get to the dimension D, let me start it easy with dimensions one, two and three as those are the dimensions we all know and understand. And so what is the dimension? In a very simple words, this would be the, uh, our, the number of degrees of freedom to move in the space. And so if we imagine that we live on a line, then we have only one degree of freedom. We can move only forwards or backwards. And so uh, on a line, the, uh, what is a ball for? What is a one-dimensional ball? One-dimensional ball, it's an interval. And the line can be covered almost perfectly with uh, intervals. So we can think of these intervals that do not overlap but only touch each other, and they will just cover all our line. And so the density of this one-dimensional packing would be one, which is somehow uh, the maximal possible density we could even hope for. And in dimension two, we have two degrees of freedom. We can move, uh, so to say here, north, east, and south, west. Um, and what is a two-dimensional ball? A two-dimensional ball, it's a disk. So here, imagine that our two-dimensional space, it would be a surface of this table. And uh, as a disk here, you can imagine, for example, one franc coins, and that we are uh, piling this uh, one franc coin so that we would like to put as many coins as we can on the table and to cover as much of the surface of this table as we can. And so after a little bit of experimenting, you can come to the, at least a hypothesis that probably this is the best way to pack disks on the surface. So into this uh, regular triangular uh, grid. Sometimes it's also called honeycomb lettuce. And so if we put our balls on the surface, like uh, our disks on a surface of a table like this, uh, then they will cover not, this time not 100%, uh, but a bit more than 90% of the surface. And we even have this exact, uh, if you like mathematics and like mathematical constants, we even have this exact formula for this approximate uh, number. And so in dimension three, 
what can we do in Dimension 3? Probably you've all been to a grocery store and you have seen their oranges piled in pyramids. And now if you think of these pyramids, if they will be prolonged infinitely to the whole store, then what we will get would be this the perfect sphere packing. And its uh, density is about 74%, or this exact constant pi divided by square root of 18. And so historically, the sphere packing in dimension 3, it was known as Kepler's conjecture. So it was a long time ago when uh, people became interested in this uh, geometric question. And the question of packing sphere seems very natural. And I guess we, uh, there are some uh, ancient Indian manuscripts with uh, text and uh, pictures that show us that even in ancient India, people thought about this question. I'm sure that this question came over again and again the, through the course of history, even though it's not my expertise domain, but in, so to say, in our modern European history, this, con this question is known as Kepler's conjecture. And so there is an interesting, quite long story behind it. Uh, so from what we know that uh, at the uh, 16th century, um, a British aristocrat had a great idea of invading Spain, or at least somehow fighting seriously with Spain. And so for this, if he wants to fight with another country, he would need a lot of cannons, and he wanted to pack them into a ship as efficiently as possible. So he asked his uh, scientist, Thomas Eriot, to tell him what is the most efficient way to pack cannonballs inside of a ship. And Thomas Eriot, he did not take this task lightly. He actually thought about it. And so we know about all this because the letters were preserved. And he actually developed this theory of a closed sphere packing. He gave uh, descriptions of what, what the best configurations would be. And he found not one, but actually two different ones. So he described all this in his letter. But also this made him think about, so packing cannonballs inside of the ships, this made him think about condensed matter and this ancient idea that maybe matter around to us consists of atoms and maybe atoms are packed inside of matter in something like cannons inside of a cannonball. So he, he was thinking about all this and he wrote a letter to his uh, uh, colleague, Johann Kepler. And Kepler also thought that this is such a beautiful idea. And the Christmas was coming and Kepler was supposed to give a present to his friends. And so to one of his friends, he gave the following present. So it was an essay, an essay of six cornered snowflake. And so here's the text he has written to his friend. I think it's very, uh, it's, it's somehow it's a nice coincidence that we are also meeting around Christmas time. So maybe if you are short in money and cannot buy a great present for your friends, maybe you can just write an essay that would be quoted 400 years later. So here you see somehow this is the dedication and also how the letter starts. So the Kepler is at least as I can, I'm not a historian, I'm not a specialist in the Renaissance time or habits people had that time, but it seems like an apology, so he could not somehow give him a present which would be of monetary value. However, he wrote an essay. And I think this is what he refers as nothing. So he tells like, I just give you nothing. And nothing is a 14 pages of a text where, uh, uh, <clears throat> so I will just g give you some, some quotes. So, so what was the main topic? So like, now joking apart, let's get back to business. And the business is the following. So Kepler was walking on a outside and he's seen snow and snowflakes. And he made an observation that all snowflakes, uh, they all are, look like starlets and they have six corners. So he could not find a snowflake that has five or seven, but almost all of them had six corners. And he was thinking, why? Why is it like this? And again, as a perfect person from a Renaissance age, he would think that probably this has nothing to do with the properties of water or properties of vapor, because vapor does not have anything, there is nothing 
uh, hexagonal about vapor, it's shapeless. Even though we know that well, he knew that time that snow comes from vapor, and so he theorized that probably there should be an agent, some agent which really likes the beauty of hexagon that forms snowflakes like this. And so may I, I leave it for you to decide how close does this bring us to atomistic theory or to the somehow formational principles of matter. Even though I think many people who study the work of Kepler, they think they interpret this in the following way, but maybe I will just leave, leave it to you. And so maybe let's better come to mathematics. And so here the question is what is so special about hexagon? And so one thing that Kepler thinks is special about hexagon are these optimiza geometric optimization problems, the pecking problems. So here he starts thinking about pecking problems. And so this is uh, uh, how the <clears throat> one of the editions of uh, his uh, essay lo looked like. And so what would be important for us are these Oh, oh, sorry, is this picture, this diagram. So here he thinks about how he could pack balls, and he thinks of his diagram A, it shows us this rectangular grid or square grid, and uh, <clears throat> diagram B shows us this uh, triangular grid. And so now out of these layers, he will produce the dense packing of uh, balls. And so this is what he writes. Again, it's interesting that in the 17th century, of, of course, people did not have all the mathematical machinery we have now. There was no algebraic notation. There was no more established language to speak about geometry. So it's all really more rather poetry than mathematics. And so what first was he, he, he suggests to do is, so let's look at this uh, diagram A and let's build our sphere packing from these uh, flat layers. And the first naive thing to do is just to put the one uh, <clears throat> square layer on the top of another so that uh, each uh, ball touches exactly one ball which is beneath and one ball which is below. And so this is what Kepler describes. Uh, here, so if we proceed like this, of course, he, sees, he, he understands that we will not get the densest packing because we can apply somehow more pressure to all this structure and then the all layers could slide and be denser, come, come, and become, dense, become denser together. And so what he does, he suggests you know, here another arrangement <clears throat> so that uh, each, uh, so, so to, to put each uh, ball of the higher configuration, not at the top of another ball, but rather in a deep hole. And so here he writes that then somehow, uh, then the packing will be the tightest possible so that if no other arrangement could be, of pellets could be stuffed into the same container. So he just claims that this is then, if we do it like this, this would be the densest packing. And this is actually the end. So Kepler is just very confident that this is the densest packing. And again, by the uh, standards of science at his time, this would, was an absolutely reasonable thing to say. So at that time, people did not think so much about mathematical proofs and the rigor of mathematical proofs. And this seems to be a, such a self-obvious statement. And so what you would, so here are some pictures. So here is the packing which, uh, um, Kepler suggested to, to build is to take, here are the, these balls in layers, and each layer is arranged as this uh, square grid. And now, for, as you see, for each ball of the next layer, we put it in this biggest hole between smallest layers, uh, between sorry, of, of previous uh, smallest, uh, the, we put it into these holes that uh, are created in the, uh, layer below, and uh, so he, uh, here, uh, what 
what we see here is uh, actually another construction. And this construction looks in the following way. So now uh, you see that uh, if you want to arrange our uh, disks on a plane, then the, uh, this triangular grid, it will be better than the square one. It will be denser. And so maybe if we start building our packing not from re rectangular la layers, but from triangular layers, maybe we can achieve something better. And so here one problem comes that in the picture here, if we put this uh, balls of a next layer to these big holes of a previous layer, then somehow miraculously there will be just enough space for, if we just put this ball as low as we can, there will be just enough space for the next ball in the hole here. And for this, oh sorry, for the tri triangular grid, it is not the case. Here we cannot put one more ball into each hole so that, it, that then there will be not enough a place for them to touch the previous layer. So we actually what we have to do, we have to choose every second hole. And uh, uh, so uh, this way we see that we have these two constructions. So the, this construction number one, which I already oh, described for you. And so here <laughs> each layer is less dense, but the layers are very, very clo uh, closer together. And the construction here, when each layer is very dense, but the layers are stay far, farther away from each other. And what I do sometimes at this part of the lecture, I ask audience to vote. Which you think is denser? Is this denser or is this denser? So who thinks that this one is more dense? Okay. And who would vote for this one? And who thinks that they're actually equally dense? Okay, so people who think that they are equally dense, they are right. And they're not only, uh, there is actually more to this story because these two uh, packings, they're not only equally dense, they are geometrically identical. And so how, and it seems somehow difficult to see it from these pictures, even if we try imagining the packings for ourselves. So let's uh, me convince you that they are, did the same, and these both uh, constructions, they give, lead to, they will lead to the same sphere packing. So, 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 so called, this configuration is called the uh, face, uh, the central, uh, uh, cubic, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, central uh, cubic uh, centered faced uh, lattice. Sorry. Faced central cubic lattice. FCC lattice, yes. Faced faces central cubic, yes. Uh, so wh wh what the name comes from? So we have this. Uh, we, we take a usual cubic lattice. And how this one works, so we think of our space as filled with cubes in a natural way. We just put cubes one onto another and then put them at first like in a perfect square grid and then extend also in, in all the dimensions. And so in, we will, in the vertices of our cubes, we will uh, locate our uh, balls and we will make the radio of our balls. Okay, so the radio of our balls, we'll think about them a bit later. We'll fix them later. But this, the, this configuration of, uh, the, uh, <coughs> of the vertices of cubes, this is what will give us the cubic lattice. And so we would like to put a, r a red ball into, of some radius, which we will choose later, and the center in here. And, but also uh, we would like to make our configuration a bit more interesting, so we'll look at all the faces of all our cubes, and we will, uh, for each face, we will choose its center, and we will put a blue ball with a center which coincides with the center of the face. And so this way, uh, we will, uh, now we can also think of this configuration as being continued in all, somehow, six uh, directions 
So here and up, down to the east, to the south, to the oh, sorry, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. Um, And so now we would have, how can we see that this lattice packing is actually coincides with the two packings we have constructed before? So I suggest doing this by coloring the balls in a different way. And then we will see that it will coincide with two configurations that I proposed before. So one way, so this, let's uh, take our cubes and draw the main diagonal in our cube. So take two points which are at the, well, the biggest possible distance. So we choose one of these main diagonals in the cube, and we will call, uh, draw the planes, which are orthogonal to this main diagonal, and we will color our balls, again, in green, in red, and blue, as I've done it in my previous picture. And so then you can see that this picture here actually is the same as this picture here, only rotated in the space. And now with the same, but configuration is the same, it's only a different coloring. And now what we can do, we can do yet another coloring. So now instead of looking at this main diagonal, we again look at our cube. And now we will look at the planes which are parallel to one of the faces of our cube. And so this way you will see that the uh, squares will emerge here. Here it is this rotated square square lattice. And so we'll see that this picture, it actually coincides with uh, oh, this construction here. And so these two configurations, they're actually the same, only rotated. So maybe you can try to imagine how you rotate it. And then you can also see that it's not that easy to do. So we, First of all, we should give credit to Kepler and to Thomas Eriot for describing these configurations, to finding them so long time ago, and maybe we also should not be that angry at mathematicians that it took them 400 years to show that this configuration is optimal. And so, okay, so here you can see it's another uh, beautiful uh, sentence from the, uh, essay by Kepler, so here he writes this somehow, that triangular pattern is impossible without the, uh, so the, the, the triangle is impossible without the square and vice versa. So, of course, uh, at that time, so, uh, pro probably what the Kepler would imply by this sentence is something like what I showed you before. So we start with triangles and then we inevitably build uh, squares in other direction. And if we start with squares, we will, by doing this kind of packing, we will still, we will build the triangles, but in yet another direction, so. And so now a few more demonstrations to, to, to show you that uh, uh, the geometric equation, optimization geometric equations can be very difficult and counterintuitive and not that easy for uh, mathematicians to solve. And so another problem, which is actually an easier question, easier than the sphere packing, is so-called uh, the question about the kissing number. So here again, the, the, uh, the name of the subject comes from another epoch, so you see that people used to romanticize geometry a lot. And so here the question is the following. So let's consider a ball, for example, here this is a two-dimensional example, so I read red ball, we remember that two-dimensional balls are disks, so we take a red ball and we want to surround our red ball of radius one with blue balls of radius one. And so our, the rule is that each blue ball is supposed to touch the red one, so this is the condition that they always have to touch. Each of the blue balls has to touch the red one and the blue balls are not allowed to intersect and they are only allowed to touch each other. And so then the, the kissing number would be the maximum number of blue balls that can surround a red ball like this. And so in dimension six, it's not a very interesting problem. Uh, so here, so in dimension two, it's not a very interesting problem. And here we obviously have six 
blue balls touching, blue discs touching the red one, and already in dimension three, the question becomes much more interesting. So, and so this was a famous discussion between Isaac Newton and David Gregory. And so Isaac Newton thought that in dimension three, the kissing number is 12. And the 12, it's easy to construct. So what we do, maybe you know a platonic body that has exactly 12 vertices. So this is the icosahedron. And so what we can do, we can take the icosahedron and put a red ball into, into its center, so we choose a red ball so that its center coincides with the center of icosahedron. And then we put blue balls so that their centers will coincide with each of the 12 vertices. And so then we, we also choose the radius of, uh, radius of, uh, of all our, of our balls to be so that the red ball inside will just touch each of the blue balls around it. And so this way, it's not a kind of an easy computation to see that if uh, all blue balls touch the red one, then they will not touch each other. They will, be, they will not also intersect. So they will be just comfortably sitting apart. And this is a configuration for 12. Uh, however, in this, we will see that uh, <coughs> there is still, it seems like there is still plenty of space left. So maybe if we choose configuration which is not so uh, symmetrical, maybe we can shift the balls, blue balls around and still find a place for the 13th. And so David Gregory, he thought that maybe if somebody tries really hard, they could squeeze the 14th ball in. Uh, however, he, he could not produce this configuration himself, but he thought that maybe if somebody spends enough of time of it, it still would be possible. And so now we know that Isaac Newton was uh, right. After all, we know that Newton did have very good intuition for mathematics. Uh, at the same time, the rigorous proof for, for this uh, geometric problem, it took quite a long time to, to find a proof like this. And the first in, somehow maybe still incomplete proofs were found in 19th century. And then the rigorous proof was written down in 1950s, so already the, the last century. And so here's another explanation. So what is so hard about the sphere packing problem? And it's also maybe something which is a bit counterintuitive. It's that I have, I've showed you these two different packings, and then I demonstrated that they actually coincide and uh, it, they are geometrically identical. However, in dimension three, we have uncountably many sphere packings which attain this the same maximal uh, density. And how it works, here again, our method of building packings from layers would work. And so you remember at some point uh, when we built a new uh, our, our packing from these triangular layers, I have told you that we cannot put uh, balls of, of a new layer into each hole between uh, the balls of a previous layer. We always have to make a choice. So we always making, have, have to make this shift. We could put them either like this or like this. And these choices, we are making them at each level. And by making these different choices, we can produce many, many packings the, which would be geometrically unequivalent to each other. And so it also explains why the sphere packing problem is mathematically a hard problem. That's because we don't have only unique great solution. We have many equal, seemingly equally great solutions. And when optimization problem has many solutions, this is a, this is a difficult problem. And so, now let me tell you a few words about mathematical proof. Uh, so as I already told you, so Kepler and Thomas Harriot, they, did not, need, they need, did not need any proofs. They could just somehow, it was obvious to them that this is the, the, the best they can do, can do. They tried, they are so smart, and probably they would not have missed a better configuration. And of course, as mathematicians, we want somehow more rigor in our argument. 
And so for many years, what was uh, an example of uh, mathematical rigor was the uh, elements written by uh, Euclid. And so here is uh, one of the oldest text that we have that contain some elements of a mathematical proof. And so, of course, <clears throat> and so as, as a mathematicians, when we want to prove something, we don't want just to write uh, somehow a poem or a text that would look be so convincing that everybody would be convinced. We have very strict rules on what constitutes mathematical proof. And maybe it's also an experience you have at some point in high school when, like, when you do study uh, planimetry or geometry, that inside of geometry you often have this argument on how to prove something, how to prove a theorem. So as we proceed in mathematics, what we usually have to do, we have to establish some axioms, so to say, ground rules, what, what constitutes a mathematical argument and what does not, and also if we work with certain interesting objects, like in geometry this would be points, lines, and planes, and balls, we have to define, uh, we, ha we have to first somehow to give the properties which are axioms, and then for things which are not the initial objects, we have to give their proper definitions, for example, for the sphere packing problem. As a mathematician, what I would have to do, I would have to really define what is the density of a sphere packing. And then we would realize that actually not every configuration of balls has a well-defined density, and I would have to play around with it, but probably I will not do it in this series of lectures. So you would just have to believe me that we work with nice configurations where the density is well-defined. And when we have our axioms and definitions, we are good to prove theorems. And so, of course, what mathematicians wanted to do for many centuries is to turn this one sentence in Kepler's uh, essay into a theorem. And there was a lot of effort and ideas and failed attempts. And so finally, the Kepler's conjecture was resolved in 19... 98 by American mathematician Thomas Hales. And this also in itself, this was an interesting story, as for, for a long time people thought that this uh, theorem is still out of, of reach. And then the strategy in the 1960s, more or less the strategy was developed on how to tackle the problem. However, it still required a lot of computational power. And uh, what Thomas Hales did, he uh, somehow pushed this, uh, really, really pushed on this uh, strategy. And so he reduced the sphere packing problem in dimension three to a number of uh, problems that can be resolved computationally, either combinatorial problems or optimization problems. And each of these problems could be used by computer. And so his proof, it was one of the first examples of a computer-assisted proof. And then it took mathematical community quite a long time and a big discussion on whether such proofs should be accepted. Is it still a proof? How much computer assistance do we allow? Uh, and, and another interesting thing is that referees were not somehow, so, so scientists who were supposed to read the paper and to say that it is correct, uh, after many years of work, they could write, okay, we think that this paper is 99% correct, but we cannot really follow all the details, especially the things which are in the, uh, done by programs. It's too hard for us. But Okay, 99% is correct, which is not so nice for mathematics. And then somehow what Thomas Hales did is he, I think it's another um, uh, <clears throat> Great, great achievement in history of mathematics, he, he would write a, a formal proof of his theorem. And so this is another interesting thing that exists now is that, uh, so as I told you that mathematicians, we do want to be like Euclid, want to be very rigorous, we want to start with axioms and definitions and then very rigorously prove all our theorems. And now we are at the point we can, where we can actually write our proof as a computer program. 
and then the compiler could check that each step is indeed correct because yeah, for referees, they just may get old before they read the paper to, to, to the end. Uh, so at the same time, and so and now I think uh, Thomas Hales was one of the first people who would write a major modern mathematical result in this fashion. And uh, now it seems that with all the technical advances, uh, this movement is getting somehow more momentum, more attention, which is also exciting and uh, interesting. And so what Tom Hales did, he actually, he wrote a formal proof of the sphere packing problem and the, the whole project took him like almost 10 years. So it was a really major, major thing because to, uh, one of the important steps also to prove, uh, to write the formal proof of his theorem, he had to somehow formalize all the prerequisites because as you uh, know, mathematicians were usually rely on work of other people. And if we want to write this in a, how to have, um, proved to be checked by a computer, we also have to explain to the computer all the previous work that has been done. And so, and so, okay, so now we are, as I told you, the sphere packing problem in dimension one is trivial, in dimension two, it's uh, not trivial, but still somehow simple, and it was resolved long time ago. What about in dimension three, it was a really big adventure for mathematicians for some very hundreds of years. But okay, one, two, three seems like we ran out of dimensions, right? We have no more degrees of freedom as uh, human beings. And so here, what comes to rescue is the uh, mathematical abstraction. And so here, maybe let me a little bit justify to you why should we look in these higher dimensions and also explain what are these higher dimensions to me as a mathematician. And so here, maybe as a metaphor, I would like to use this uh, illustration to a book about Alice through the looking, who went through the looking glass. Uh, actually, the book which was also written by a mathematician, maybe that's why it appeals to me so, so much. Uh, so we have somehow our experience from the everyday world and we are intelligent creatures and of course we use our intellect to, uh, to think about it to make our lives easier. And then as we think about our everyday experience, we can also come up with abstractions. I think people are also very good to, to coming up with abstractions and some of them are the abstractions I'm interested in are the mathematical ones. And so we can bring our uh, concepts of, uh, of real life into an abstract form. And I would describe this process as going through a looking glass. So we started with something which was real, then we think of its possible reflection in the world of ideas, and now another step we do, so now we try, as mathematicians, we start living on this side. And this uh, world of mathematical abstractions, it is in some sense reflection, of course, of all our human experience. At the same time, as in the book about Alice, it is slightly different. The laws that govern there are different. And so if, as a human, I have only three degrees of freedom to move myself, on this side, I might have more. I just have to find the correct mathematical abstraction for that. And so with dimensions, with mathematical dimensions, it's actually very easy. So as I already told you, the dimension, it's a number of degree of freedom. And what it means, it means that if I want to describe a point in space, I need three real numbers to do it, three coordinates. So you can think of it as a GPS coordinates, for example. Uh, so here, this is the point with coordinates. So this is the origin, and this is the point with coordinates minus one, one, one. And now if I think of a point as this, somehow this row of its, uh, the list of its coordinates, now nothing stops me from adding, simply adding more numbers to this list. And that's it, this is how dimension is, or of Euclidean space is defined in mathematics. And so here, well, another thing which somehow often I think confuses people is that, for example, if we are physicists, then our, whatever we are working with is supposed to have physical meaning. So and very often in physics, it's useful to introduce extra dimensions like Einstein. He introduced this fourth dimension, which would be time. 
Uh, and as a mathematician, I don't somehow, I have more freedom, I have luxury to say I don't care about what fourth dimension is. The fourth dimension could be a time, or I could add two more dimensions, or I could say that maybe my dimensions, they're just some numbers on Excel sheet with salaries of people working in the same organization, and it would be totally, totally normal for a mathematician. I don't need to think about an interpretation, I just think about the logical structure of things. And it turns out that the sphere packing problem can be easily generalized to higher dimensions. And so here, are the, what we should do, we have to define the d-dimensional Euclid, Euclidean space. And so our points, they are these lists of coordinates. So if we have dimension d, then we have d different coordinates. Each coordinate is a real number. And so now if we want to think about sphere packing problem, we need a bit more information. Uh, so what we, if we want to define what a ball is, so in, dimension, in each dimension, the ball, it's a set of points which are at a certain distance at the most certain distance from the center of the ball. And so we already know what a point is, what a, uh, we, now we need to know what's a distance. And so here we introduce a distance between point in this way. So this would be the usual Euclidean distance. And probably if you remember the Pythagoras theorem from school, then you would recognize that this is exactly the Pythagoras, if in dimension two, this would be exactly the Pythagoras theorem which also works in dimension three. But now we can actually introduce as many coordinates as, a, as, as we want, as we have decided here. And so this would be the distance between these two uh, points. And so maybe this is something, of course, uh, uh, Kepler would not have because he did, at, at his time, so the algebraic notation was not developed yet and it was not used systematically by uh, scientists at his time. But we do have this luxury now. And so now after we have defined what is a distance, we can define what is a ball. So it would be a set of all points. So if you, if you want to have a ball of, with centered point x and radius r, it would be just the set of all points which are distance at most r from point x. And also somehow another thing which we need for our uh, f to define the, the sphere packing problem is the notion of volume. It's a quite useful notion, but uh, I will not somehow here things get maybe way, way too complicated. I will not write it down, but I will just tell you that there is a meaningful mathematical way how to define volume in higher dimensions. And so uh, after we have uh, uh, define these higher dimensions, what we can do, we can also think of configurations. And it turns out that mathematicians have this ability and in dimensions, for example, up to 10, they have already listed uh, the number of configurations that they believe are optimal. Uh, so it's somehow for, uh, so for all the rows which are in green, these are the rows where we actually do know the answer in the sense that we have a mathematical proof that this configuration is optimal and those which are in black, uh, these dimensions are still open, so we have candidates, but we don't know whether they are optimal or not, so maybe if there are young mathematicians in this room, maybe they can choose one of their favorite dimensions and try to, try to start working on that. And we also see that somehow what also this table shows that uh, the sphere packing in higher dimensions has this very strange flavor is that each dimension, it's always, a, it's, it feels like a completely new problem. Uh, so in some dimensions, like in dimension one, in dimension two, uh, like four, eight, we have only one configuration, unique configuration, which, which does the job, which is the best sphere packing. And there are many dimensions which are more like our favorite dimension three, where we have this many, many geometrically distinct configurations. So we can do something similar to, uh, for example, choosing stacking layers in different ways, and we will actually get not one answer, but many, typically uncountably many answers. And of course, when dimension becomes more than 10, then we lose somehow our confidence. Sometimes we still have great configurations, but 
we don't have this confidence to say that they are really the best. And so this is now the list of the dimensions where we exactly know what the optimal density is. And so, okay, so as I told you, the dimension one is trivial. And dimension two, it was not a very difficult question, even though it was, I think, what was difficult for mathematicians is to decide which proofs are rigorous and which are not, because some of the proofs, they were quite old, and maybe there was still some hand-waving there. And probably, in, I think in, in one of my lectures, actually, I plan to demonstrate a simple, because these proofs, they have been so discussed and simplified a lot, and maybe now we are at the, uh, moment when it's actually possible to explain to somebody who knows only school uh, geometry to explain the proof. So what I found in the literature, for example, uh, there is a two-page proof of this uh, result. So my goal for this series of lectures is actually to demonstrate one of these short, short proofs. Then there is a uh, Dimension three, which I already told you that dimension three is very complicated. It's a dimension where we have this uncountably many optimal solutions. And uh, there is a the computer assisted proof by Thomas Hales. And then there are two more dimensions where we know the answer. So this is my own work in dimension eight. We have this unique configuration that was believed to be the best. And I actually was able to prove that it is the best. And proof in dimension eight, it turns out it was much shorter, so for example, the Proof in dimension three, it is uh, at least 100 pa pages text and also many, many lines of code, while uh, this proof, it took only like, 20 pages and a small computer program to verify certain positivity condition. And then working together with Henry Cohn, Nabinav Kumar, Steven Miller, and Daniel Ratchenko, we were able to solve the sphere packing problem in dimension 24, because in dimension 24, we also have an exceptional object, so-called leech lattice, and it is the unique confu optimal configuration in dimension 24. And so, so here are my co-authors. So I decided to use this somehow opportunity to show them to you, since we already seen Kepler and Harriot, we can also see my collaborators. Uh, and so let me, I still have so eight minutes left. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about these higher dimensions and also a little, uh, advertise the new lecture. So some of these questions I will stop more in the future lectures. So this is, uh, uh, so as I told you in dimension eight, we have this very special object, the so-called E8 lattice. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to visualize things in dimension eight. So here I'm using the following trick. So for example, you can see my hand, it's a three-dimensional object. And if I rise it here in front of the projector, it will create a shadow, and the shadow is two-dimensional. And also if I rotate my hand, the shape of the shadow will be changing. And so what is here, it's really, it's also, it's a three-dimensional shadow of the shortest vectors of the E8 lattice. So what it means, so you remember I told you about the kissing problem. And so if we have, so here this is the kissing configuration, which was uh, constructed from the E8 lattice. So we choose one ball in the E8 uh, ball packing, and we also look at all the balls which touch this one. So we do not try to visualize all the E8 lattice, but only one ball and all other balls that touch it. And it turns out that in dimension, so for example, in dimension three, we could have one disk could be touched by six others. In dimension three, one ball can be touched by 12 others. And in dimension eight, uh, one ball can be touched by 240 other balls. So this is somehow this strange behavior of high dimensions. So this is what high dimensions are about. Is in high dimensions, we just have much more space. And so now uh, what, what, what is done here, it's a projection from the eight-dimensional space into some three-dimensional subspace. Uh, 
Uh, so it's like a three-dimensional shadow. And of course, here we also have this choice of a, a subspace where we are projecting, but this one was chosen so that the result is somehow symmetrical. And uh, the, this model is created from a, uh, <clears throat> so from a constructor which is called Zoom. Maybe if you have ever been to a math museum, maybe you've seen it. So it's this kind of uh, medium to create various three-dimensional models. Uh, and so, okay, so here is another object, the one which lives in dimension 24, and here I could not find the three-dimensional model of this. So this is a three-dimensional uh, it's a two-dimensional shadow, and by the way, if you uh, go to, so uh, as I told you, like as with my hand, if I rotate my hand, it, the shape of the shadow will change. So for example, you, if you go to YouTube, there are many, many uh, beautifully done videos of different projections, for example, of shortest vector of E8 lattice or shortest vectors of Leach lattice that are projected on, for example, on a plane, and then the plane is changed, so it is, becomes a cartoon, and some people are very skilled in drawing it beautifully and rendering it, so it's a bit like a screensaver. So, so of course, like on one hand, these uh, uh, videos and uh, pictures like this, they can look very beautiful. At the same time, maybe I can tell you as a mathematician, unfortunately, these visualizations, they're not extremely useful for understanding the geometry. I still think the best way to understand this uh, structures is the method of mathematical abstraction and visualization. It's mostly for aesthetic purposes and for yeah, entertainment. Okay, and and in, in dimension, in, in, in the little, latest, actually, one, uh, one ball is touching almost uh, uh, 200,000 other balls, so a bit, a bit less than that. So somehow you see that somehow these dimensions, they really things in high dimension behave very strangely. And so, maybe the last thing I would like to tell you, also the one, one thing I would like to advertise for the future is the history of, for example, discovery of Leach lattice. It's a very beautiful story, and I think it is beautiful because the, this mathematical object, which has a lot of great properties and is loved by a mathematician, was actually first discovered by an engineer so this is Marcel, uh, oh, not, not by, so it was discovered, sorry, it was discovered, actually, it's Leach lattice, it was discovered by John Leach, who's a Canadian mathematician, but the discovery of John Leach was only possible because of a <clears throat> work of uh, Marcel Gallet, and Marcel Gallet, he was not a, really a mathematician, he was an engineer, and his uh, motivation for studying such objects was very practical. He was studying the error correcting codes. And so he created a code which was called the Galay code. And then his code was, was used by uh, John Leach to construct the Leach lattice, which we are now using for sphere packing. And then somehow the same object led to a lot of discoveries in mathematics, which I hope I will speak a little bit in one of my next lectures. And so another topic I also would like to cover is the, this connection between error correcting and sphere packings. Uh, so this would be the main heroes of my uh, uh, talk, uh, of, of, of my story. And yes, so this is somehow the, what the er error correcting means and how it is co con collect connected to the sphere packing. So this all will come in the future lectures. And so this is somehow the slide to tell you that error correcting is very important and many of the technical advances would not be possible uh, without it. And then again, maybe one thing I should say that I am a pure mathematician, so my love for sphere packing does not come from this a great real life applications. It actually comes from the uh, intellectual beauty of it and also my belief that whenever something is fundamental in science, it will inevitably become useful in everyday life as well. So, so now I'm, I think I'm ready to answer the questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat>